Uh, however, that uh, it seems that uh, Brazil now is uh, has a very heavy burden of debt, uh, which in my eyes I, I think uh, it's uh, the the current main obstacle. Which debt are you referring to now? Uh, expressed in dollar, U.S. dollar. Well, no, and due to no, due to no, 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 not really. I mean, the the foreign debt, the sovereign debt, now is quite modest in, in relation to the reserves. That's for some time now, that has no longer been our problem. So uh, we don't depend on the International Monetary Fund. Anything. Uh, we don't have to go asking for money. The Brazilian National Development Bank is three times the size of the World Bank. So it's simply not true. Uh, so uh, in China, uh, actually China used uh, the drill strategy of export orientation together with uh, import substitution and use the latter to support it, uh, the former one, to use the foreign exchange earned in the latter form. Uh, and in Brazil, I think uh, you, you have tried both now, but uh, it seems that... Uh, both, both which? Uh, in one time you use a subs uh, import, import substitution, substitution and then yeah. later you, you change it to export orientation and have some, uh, get some effects, but, yeah. but now you, you, it seems that uh, the result is still not satisfactory. I'm, I mean, maybe that's why you mentioned uh, Brazil has to find a, a new way to change the, the near colonial relationship between uh, China and Brazil. Yeah. So there's, there's, no, there's no real uh, contradiction or choice between deepening the internal market and producing for export. Yeah, I, I they, they obviously can and should be complementary. But the question is, what's the content? What is the distinctive direction of the strategy of economic growth? To, to my mind, the crucial point is the dilemma that I described. It's nothing about importing, import substituting industrialization versus export. It's a very particular dilemma which is not yet understood in the world and is something new. And the sharpest way to formulate it is, is to say uh, the message of classical development economics, which is transfer workers from the less productive sector to the more productive yeah. sector, meaning from agriculture to manufacturing, yes. understood as for this mass production, no longer works for a series of reasons. It is no longer an adequate and feasible basis of economic growth. The alternative would be the, the deepening and dissemination of the subsequent most advanced practice of production, and no one knows how to do it. So the, the, the received practice has ceased to work, and the alternative practice remains inaccessible. That's the particular problem, and I regard these debates about export versus import substituting industrialization as a diversion because they, they're, they're false contradictions. That, that's not the problem. The problem is on what basis will we now grow our economies? If we find the right basis, that basis will contribute both to the deepening of the internal market and to an engagement with the world economy. So, and, and this then leads me to another reflection, which goes beyond the terms of our conversation here. Uh, what has happened, to my mind, in all of these economies in the world, is that the structural imbalances in the world economy have been used by each major country as a way to evade the task of structural transformation. So China, instead of, 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 of deepening its internal market, exports its surpluses. The Americans, instead of developing a productivist project, uh, live off of credit and debt, made possible by the Chinese trade and capital surpluses. And the Brazilians, instead of reindustrializing their economy on another basis, try to find the easy way out through the export of commodities to China. So it's a triangle in which each of the elements of the triangle is using the imbalances in the world economy as a way to escape the task of structural change. And it seems that, that, that's the real problem. It seems that the root is centered on the international monetary system, which centered on the US dollar. 
No, I don't think so. No, I think I, I, I don't think that's the root. I think I think that it's true that the that the world monetary arrangements are one of many aggravants to this circumstance. They aggravate the circumstance. But they're far from being the cause. So uh, uh, if, if you were to make a long list of things that would need to change to, to make this alternative more feasible, uh, uh, one of the things halfway down the list would be you would need to develop the internal capital markets that allow these countries to borrow in their own currency. And then way down the list, much further down the list, would be the residual role of the dollar as the international currency. Because that gives an inordinate power to the Americans, to the United States Treasury. But it's, as a factual matter, it's a relatively secondary influence on these factors. I think there is a problem in the culture of economics. And the problem in the culture of economics is that this established line of economic theory is, has great difficulty in apprehending structural problems and structural alternatives. So it tries to find solutions in the phenomena with which it's accustomed to deal. And one of these phenomena is money. Uh, so that's, that's how they think, because they have no way of thinking about structural alternatives. 我的问题就是说您的问题就是说那个是不是就是巴西那个外债是一个很大的一个负担但他回答他认为现在巴西因为也许就因为商品出口处理商品出口他巴西的外汇储备已经很多目前现在其实这个外债他认为不是主要的问
uh, for small business, what you do is, is the democratization. You can uh, encourage the innovation and also increase the, uh, their income. And uh, uh, as in, in the big companies, you increase the role of the workers to also uh, make the primary income distribution better. So, and also it can also uh, inspire innovation. So in, in digital ways, you cannot uh, now not only inspire innovation, but also uh, make the primary income distribution better, then it's, it's, it's easier for you to, to do the, the secondary distribution. I think this maybe will of course, that's, that's, good that, results. that's one of the most important things. It's always, it's always better, more powerful, to change the arrangements that influence the primary distribution rather than to correct the primary distribution by retrospective redistribution through progressive taxation and redistributive social spending. The most powerful is to change the original distribution, yes. But I just, but I, but I want to make a comment regarding your, your observation about the big firms because I think you're understating the dimension of the problem. <clears throat> in this uh, insular, hyper-insular form of the knowledge economy, what is, one of the things that's happening is that a very small number of mega firms in areas such as high technology manufacturing are controlling the development of the practice of production. And they have discovered a way to factor out, to abstract from their production process everything that can be routinized. And then the routinized parts, the commoditized parts, are assigned to factories in remote parts of the world. So you have a tiny group of people in California who are inventing things and making the profits. And then you have hundreds of thousands of people in enterprises like Foxconn who are following orders in the, in, in the belated Fordist model of production. That system of hyperinsularity combined with belated Fordism uh, then results in the creation of these vast multitudes of precarious workers and in the confinement of the advanced practice of production to these fringes. That's what we have to attack. Uh, and we can't attack that simply by giving the workers a bigger voice in, in the mega firms. The reality is that they already have a tiny number of workers. In Google, the workers already have voice because it's, it's a tiny privileged group of people. That's not the problem. The problem is the, the quarantining of the, uh, of the advanced practice in the control of a tiny technological and entrepreneurial elite. And that's not in our national interest. We have to rebel against that situation. So this relates to your inclusive, <coughs> inclusive vanguardism. <laughs> inclusive vanguardism, yes. So, <笑>除了中小企业以外就是大企业的本身的工人的权利也应该扩大那么安格尔回答就是说呃我是那个人脑子有点累了安格尔回答就是说这个他觉得就是对这个知识经济这个问题的那个严重性就是知识经济那个被
，对，但是最后他就说提出一些和国务院发展中心的一些进一步合作的建议，他个人是非常感兴趣，并且是比如说甚至可以规定人来，就是通过那个 video， 就就 v video 也可以加强这个合作。他说这是一个就是中国和巴西共同的一个阴谋，就是来这个。这个和就是打破目前的国际秩序的改，至少改进这个秩序的一个阴谋，他说的。所以 destination to inclusive the mass、uh, mass people into the our economic、uh, development and、uh, to the intelligence intensive economic economics. You need some precondition like education, social norms,、yeah. and institution. So what kind of Education, we do need. You just mentioned a little bit. I I want to hear more. And、uh, more important is what kind of education system or other social system can we reach to this kind of education outcome? Because now there is a lot of discussion about the education reforms, like in Finland or in some other countries. So it is said that the nowadays the traditional education system is totally failed. To meet this requirement, and also I, you just mentioned that in、uh, traditional conventional、uh, industrialization, that the workforce don't need to be tra、uh, trained. Don't they do not need much more education? But、uh, from my opinion, that to working hard, to follow some instructions, to work together, also need to also need in some education, not not the. Not the same education like we we learn something in the classroom, but they also have some kind of quality requirement. So that's my question. Thank you. Well,、uh, I I I think it's really not the occasion to enter into de a detailed discussion of particular parts of the program. I have ideas about these things. I've written about them,、uh, but I don't think this is the moment to have a detailed discussion about the nature of education. I, I, at a certain moment in the conversation, I signaled what I think that it, it must be a different kind of education,、uh, analytic, synthetic, cooperative, and dialectical. And in so far as it's technical, it must focus on higher order capabilities rather than on job specific and machine specific skills. It's very different from the education needed for. For this mass production, I I reaffirm they they don't need to be educated. They need to obey. They need to obey. They 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 need to be able to read instructions,、uh, and uh, uh, and they need to have hand-eye coordination.、Uh, it's like the difference between a conventional infantry battalion and a guerrilla operation.、Uh, the guerrilla operation, the special force, is a higher level.、Uh, And especially if you imagine that the regular army will itself, at a large scale, acquire the characteristics of a special force, of a guerrilla force. That's the highest military idea. And what we're discussing in the institutional arrangements of the knowledge of, of the inclusive knowledge economy is the productive equivalent to this military thesis. 对，他说的问题就是关于这个，希望了解更具体的，关于他这个，比如教育改革方面的内容是什么？呃，比如说，呃，那么他觉得就是今天今天这个时间，就是不是好像不是讨论特别具体的，他这个问题的时候，他其实昨天在清华倒是讨论了这个教育的问题，但他就主要的他举个例子就是说，就像那个步兵师和游击队，他这个游击队他觉得是其实是更高级的一种。其实，其实很多步兵师的一个最高理想就是说，整个军队都要有游击队那种机动性，但同时还有一个有一个组织性和有一个什么有一个协调性，但它也还有有的机动性，这是一个最高的理想，但实际上，呃，对，但但是这是理想。So, so I, my suggestion is that we adjourn now and continue the conversation in four minutes. 好，咱们就差不多。这个，这个。今天这个，呃，阿米尔教授这个这个交流，我觉得非常的成功，是吧？收获非常大。
呃，另外呢，这个这个今天这活动的中心的科研处呃给予了很大支持，然后宏观部的呃陈部长和政治部长也都给予了这个呃非常积极的支持。另外，各个研究部的，我没想到我们这几个研究部、研究所的领导都都来了，都参加了今天的这个活动。呃，我呃呃代表我个人吧，向大家表示这个感谢。呃，另外呢，这个因为我要一会儿马上要到机场去赶飞机，呃，所以没法请呃两呃教授们吃饭。然后我想请像振宇和那个世纪，因为这常常有有事儿。呃呃，有没有呃时时间的替我请一下，然后我来道歉，我各地来道歉。然后呢，你们有时间都一块参与，然后吃饭的时候还可以再进一步的交流，是吧？深深入的交流。哎，好，谢谢。那我们咱们去，呃。